So a couple days ago, um, <clears throat> I was at this little youth camp, and this leader at the end was talking to these other leaders, and he goes, yeah, there was this guy up north years ago that was at a grocery store, and he had the faith to pray for the lady in front of him, and she had, like, hearing aids, and, you know, he activated her faith by saying, do you hear me? Step back. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? And she was so far back that the cashier uh, standing next to this guy couldn't hear or to this person, but that means the person got radically healed because it was beyond even normal hearing. But then it, it, it was like a domino effect of these miracles that happened that, you know, this lady's crying, the cashier, and he grabs the, um, the intercom and says, hey, guys, God just healed this lady of deafness, complete deafness in the ears. And, you know, if you need a healing or a miracle, come to aisle 10, you know. <laughs> And then he started calling out words of knowledge in the grocery store on the intercom. And there's like all these people that get healed at, you know, they're looking for like donuts and coffee or whatever at a grocery store and they're encountering God. And about like 10 people give their life to Jesus, like just crazy things. But anyways, I'm hearing the story from this leader at this youth camp here. I'm like, that's funny you say that because I'm friends with that guy that did that, and he's actually coming into town to preach um, tonight. And so it's just crazy how word of mouth can spread. And I talked to Chad about it just the other day, and I was like, man, what made that special, you know, that testimony that went all over? And he goes, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for me to show off and say, look what God did through me. He actually kept it to himself and the Lord for two weeks because he wasn't doing it just for another testimony. And so out of that place of humility and just saying, God, this is between you and me and who you want to touch, um, God just radically just spread it all over. But um, yeah, I just want to honor just, uh, just Chad here in this place. He's one of my good friends and um, been a lot of places around, you know, South Africa and different places. But one thing I really enjoy about Chad is he's very relational. Like he really cares for people. Um, and he's a maximizer. So it's like if you hang out with him for a few days, it's like from 7 a.m. to like 10 p.m. full throttle. And it's amazing. He's talking about someone maximizing every day. And I feel like you've already lived like 50, 60 years and you're only like 38 or whatever. You know, you've already lived double, at least, maybe triple. So, I don't want to talk any longer, but let's just give it up for Chad. <clears throat> yeah, I love you, bro. Thanks, Daniel. So good to be with you guys. Um, I mean, I've been coming here, I don't know, for like three or four years or something like that to the Pearl, and it's just been... A blast to get to know Roger and Roxanne. Uh, always love having our, our meals and get to just hang out and talk and just, uh, you know, just, yeah. I got wrecked by the Lonnie Frisbee books. Um, you know, my parents grew up uh, going to the vineyard in the 80s and, uh, and then getting to know Lonnie through the Set Free movement. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, you know, it's just a... Uh, it's a privilege. And then my dad got rocked. Um, he had this whole Lonnie Frisbee like experience. Then he wrote the book, uh, ultimate treasure hunt. I don't know if you've ever heard of treasure hunting, but, um, it really came out of an encounter that he had with the Lord that had to do with Lonnie Frisbee. So it's pretty interesting and just, uh, yeah, it's just an amazing time to be alive. And, uh, literally, you know, that, um, I was in a severe car accident in October uh, of last year, 2018, and uh, I might share a little bit about that, and, uh, um, but it really is good to be alive. Uh, I was ejected through the sunroof, and they say that 73% of those that get ejected through the vehicle end in a fatality. So literally, when I say I'm happy to be alive, I'm really happy to be alive, and it's a really good season. It's a good season. 
Um, Jesus, where do I want to start? I have a couple of things that are on my heart to share with you guys. Um, we'll just start it from this place. I'm, I'm probably share about my accident in a second, but first I want to bring some context to what I want to share tonight. And uh, in April, uh, I was really spending time with the Lord, and in April, God spoke to me and says, Chad, I want you to pray begin to pray into the month of April for the rest of the next five months that this would be the summer of peace and this would be the summer of hope. And I'm going to talk about peace tonight. And so I, I don't have enough time to talk about peace and hope, um, but I have enough time to talk about peace, maybe to like tip the iceberg really on peace. And, uh, and so I'm going to share a little bit about that and then I'm going to, you know, We'll just see where we go and see where we land, but it's going to be awesome. Uh, the definition of peace, freedom from disturbance, tranquility. Freedom from disturbance, tranquility. That sounds amazing. You know why I, what triggers me in thinking about tranquility and peace, uh, I was going through a pretty rough season how many here have been through a rough season? Yeah. So uh, uh, if you haven't, then you should like check your pulse or something like that. But what's cool is like we're called to be more than overcomers, right? But the crazy thing is, is you have to overcome something. You know, everyone loves like glory to glory. You know, you like that scripture, you know, like... Like we're praying for revelation. Sometimes I'm a little like concerned when I'm praying for revelation because revelation bursts responsibility, which requires accountability. You're responsible for what you know. Going glory to glory, everyone loves the glory part, but no one really talks about the two part. Transition, going glory to glory, you know, the two is transition. I love transition. Like the most, I remember sitting in my uh, back deck overlooking the mountains. It's in Redding, California. And you get to look at Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen. And, and I'm out there watching the sunset. And the Lord starts speaking to me about transition. And he's, he begins to tell me how people are always, when they're in the midst of transition, they can't wait to get out. Like, won't this season end? I'm tired of transition. I'm tired of wandering. There's actually nutrients that are being given to you during transition. That Israel was in transition to the, go to the promised land, and Moses was leading them. And that's like a 12-day journey. But it took them multiple decades You guys doing OK? <laughs> The Lord started speaking to me about transition while watching the sunset. And God's, you know, I just love dialoguing with the Lord. And the Lord's like, isn't it interesting that people will wake up super early in the morning to climb a mountain and watch the sunrise? Or they'll you know, make dinner reservations at the beach during the hours of the sunset. That people will make it a priority to watch the sunrise or the sunset. They'll even have moments of inconvenience to capture that moment. And it is a moment of transition. In a 24-hour cycle, the transition of day becoming night, night becoming day are the most beautiful parts of a 24-hour cycle. So the most beautiful parts of our lives should be transition. All that to say is, uh, talking about tranquility and peace, I was going through kind of a rough season. This was in 2015. Um, I mean, you know, just bullet points of a tough season is I, I had uh, four surgeries. Um, we had a miscarriage. I lost most of my grandparents. I lost three grandparents. My wife lost all of her grandparents. Um, just a number of different things were happening in a, in a, you know, I got iritis, went blind for two weeks. That's caused by stress. Started going through like anxiety for the first time. And this is like 2000 beginning or the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. 
Um, just a number of diff different like bummer moments that just were little chinks, you know, that the enemy was using in my armor of, is God good? There's death around me. There's, you know, stuff's happening that's like rocking my world. And, and I'm just in this place of like, you know, God, like, where are you? And then finding him in those little places. And so my wife, we went to Chico and she bought me a block of time to go into a float tank. You guys ever heard of a float tank? Float tank is, it has the minerals of the Dead Sea. It's a form of a detox. Uh, and you go into the sensory deprivation tank. It's completely dark. And she signed me up for two hours. And I show up and they're like, um, this is your first time doing this? Like normally you wanna go in for like 20 to 30 minutes. And, I'm, and my, my wife's there and she's like, oh no, my husband loves the salt water. He's a surfer. He just loves being in there. Like he'd be fine for two hours. And, and so I went in there and it was incredible. Like it's like one of the, like the definitions of tranquility. Like I felt tranquil in this like sensory deprivation, you know, no cell phones, no technology. It was just incredible. This place of being still and knowing who God is. And it just brought me to this place of peace. And so I've been praying and do, Lord, let this be the summer of peace. And Jesus just began to woo me that I would begin to pray that I've encountered Jesus as the healer. I've encountered him as my provider. I've encountered him as my best friend. But I want to encounter the Prince of Peace. You know, Jesus, in the midst of a storm, his disciples are freaking out and they were consumed with fear. They even tell the savior of the world, do you even care that if we're going to die? Like, that's a pretty crazy accusation to the savior of the world. Do you not care about our lives? Yeah, he's the savior of the world. Yes, he would care about your life. And he just says, peace, be still. In the midst of the storm, this place of authority, this place where the ultimate manifestation of peace was this place of rest, this place where he was sleeping. When I was going through anxiety, that was one of the things that got attacked in me. I would have night sweats. I lost a bunch of weight. People would ask me, Man, you're losing so much weight. You know, like, how, what's your secret? And I'm like, uh, road biking and anxiety. It's an amazing combo. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I have to just throw people off, you know? Like, <laughs> it's always great, too, when you're going through anxiety and they're like, yeah, hey, it looks like you lost a lot of weight. Is that healthy? And I'm like, dang, I don't know. Like, is it? I mean, You know that 70% of Americans are operating out of sleep deprivation? That sleep deprivation is one of the biggest triggers for mental, for spiraling of mental health. The enemy is definitely attacking our sleep. And so I just began to just pray and begin to like study about sleep and like, you know, and it's been awesome. And it's really, really cool to be doing this when you have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. Because that's what I'm working with. But I would just begin to just pray, God, let this be the summer of peace in the midst of a four-year-old and a one-year-old, a one-year-old who's teething. Let this be the summer of peace. Because it's about this place of inter internal peace. That's not dictated by the storms of my life, the circumstances, the waves that are crashing, that I could you know, say to those places, peace be still, that, that I would encounter the Prince of Peace. Here's a couple of scriptures on peace that I'm gonna to read to you guys. You guys doing well? All right. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Make every effort to have peace with everyone. So there's this whole place of peace among your community with your relationships. And it's an interesting time that we live in. Do you know Gen Xers and baby boomers when they were top tier millennial ages, meaning like 30 to 37, that's how like the top, the older millennials, that's, that's how old we are. I'm an outlaw, I mean, I'm a tweener, I guess they call it. Like uh, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer and a millennial, I'm, I'm an 81 baby. And, uh, but <clears throat> so anyways, I can understand this a bit. But uh, they say that baby boomers and Gen Xers in their communities had 17 points of contact a week with their community. Meaning you, they would go to the grocery store on Tuesday at 4 p.m. and they would always see the same cashier. That was a point of contact. That they talked to their mailman. That, that, that um, they knew their neighbors. Do you know that this is a, this among urban cities, millennials only know 21% of their neighbors. That's crazy. There's something about community that we're in search for as a generation. Connection points. So baby boomers and Gen Xers had 17 points of contact. Millennials have three points of contact today. Three points of contact. Now I'm not, you have to understand that it's coming, I'm bringing up a conversation. That's, that would be a good thing. And I go to pastors around America, around Europe, uh, around Australia, New Zealand, these first world pastors, and I'll ask them, hey, what's your average family attendance? per month and they'll say one to twice a month and a lot of these pastors are like been pastoring for 30 years 35 years and I'm like well what was it like in the 90s and early 2000s because I remember I went to church like two to three times a week and they'd be like yeah that's what normal like church attendance was was two to three times a week and I sometimes will get around my friends or some, you know, that are younger than me. And they're like, I don't feel connected to church. and church, I find no community. And I'm like, how many times are you there? Once a month? And they're like, well, that's only 12 touch points a year. Like, I don't think that's not setting you up for success. Now, obviously, this is a bigger discussion, but it's a point is beginning to find those places where you find community and you're going to begin to find peace. Uh, we'll just throw another statistic. Is in 1960, they said that those that were living alone, that were, you know, between the ages of 30 to 50, 7%, 7 were living alone. Now it's over one third. You know, I've had to battle just different things, whether it be anxiety or whatever, and it's crazy how the enemy loves, when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, he loves to isolate you and make you feel like you're completely alone. And you might even have circumstances that are screaming that you are alone. Gosh, are you guys doing okay? Am I like a little too intense or something? I, <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I've been studying this stuff for, for me. So I'm just kind of just letting it all, you know, this is, this is stuff that I'm discovering, which is awesome. Let's go back to scripture. <laughs> I mean, isn't it interesting? Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Like, isn't it intriguing covenant? That's super intriguing to me. Like, I, covenant is relationship. 
and to study relationships, to study covenant, to study how God designed covenant with us. And that there's, it's crazy that one of the ingredients of covenant is inconvenience. Like, he's not saying, hey, if this happens, you know, if you've got some disruption in your relationship, you know, relationships, like try to, you know, you're going to find peace if you just try. Like, like, no, like go out there. Like you're going to have disruptions. You're going to have inconvenience. You're going to have some bummer moments and the, to pursue wholeness, connectivity, that it's going to bring peace in your life. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, that's just, you know, I'm, I'm used to kids running around. That's, I'm, I'm Mozambique, you know, I'm, 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 my wife and I are ordained through Iris and Bethel, and so the kids are running around like crazy. Just bring it on. I love it. But it's, it's, it's so crazy to say yes to relationship, yes to inconvenience that it brings peace into our lives. First Peter 3.11, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. So isn't that interesting, seeking peace? You know, you got in Philippians where it talks about the peace that surpasses all understanding. We're in a day that is demanding answers. Like, you know, like we need to have everything make sense. Gosh, I'm not going to get on that soapbox. But, but, but the deal is, is it's peace that surpasses all understanding. It's not blind faith. Like when I got saved and I became a new creation, I was out of a place of rebellion. I was rebelling against my parents. I was rebelling against God. I was a pastor's kid. And um, I started, you know, doing drugs at a very young age. And, uh, and after doing drugs for several years, I was 14 years old. And uh, I was in my bedroom, and Jesus came to me in the natural and said, you're either going to be my best friend or I'm handing you over to Satan. And so I knew that this was a line in the sand. And I said, Jesus, I want you to be my best friend. I know that you're the only way, truth, and life. I want you to be my best friend. And the moment he hugged me, the moment he came and embraced me, I just like everything, all the rebellion, all that stuff just lifted right off and I became a new creation. And that's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Like, how do you know you're saved? I just know that I know that I know that I'm saved. It's a peace. I mean, Martin Luther would, he had this, you know, the Reformation and saved by grace. And, and there were many people that never had the salvation experience. Martin Luther was in this pursuit for months into years of, did you have the salvation experience yet? Like, and Jonathan Edwards in the first great awakening in the 1700s, he, you know, they, they would talk about it. They would be in weeks of, of prayer and, and petition of, did you have your salvation experience yet? And then Catherine Coleman, before she was a healing, you know, revivalist, she was an evangelist. And if you study, like, in the 40s and 50s, there was this evangelism deal, like this harvest where people would pray until 2 or 3 in the morning, and then, boom, they would have a salvation experience. And that's that peace that surpasses all understanding. Well, you get that. You could have it. It's available. Peace that surpasses all understanding. But then when you begin to have doubt come in and, and you know, all this, whatever you want to call it, we're not going to get into my buddy Sean Foyt did a crazy post the other day and it caused a, a good stirring, you know, um, but we're not going to go, whether it be dualism or whatever it may be, the de deconstruction of the church, all that fun stuff. But when you start having these conversations and you start bringing them in, it can cause where it chips away at that peace. Like it's got to make all sense. We've got to make, you know, all the angles. We've got to, no, Jesus makes sense. And it's a simple gospel. You know, you know, Paul went into Athens and did the whole debate and did the man's wisdom deal, and he had very little fruit. And that when he was coming back from that in 1 Corinthians, he says, hey, you know what? New game plan. I'm only going to know nothing but Christ crucified. And I'm going to come with the power of God. 
peace that surpasses all understanding. It's not blind faith. It's this anchor in your spirit that you are a new creation. And I know that I know that I know Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. It was a place of surrender. It was a place of trust. And what you got back is peace. I love this. James 3.18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Proverbs 12.20, deceit is in the hearts of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace have joy. I love that. Jesus. So I had a dream in 2016 that I was stand up paddleboarding Big Sur and these two healing angels came down from heaven. And this was like a dream that I had at night. And they started, they had paddles and they started stirring the waters and I started spinning in a circle. And then the air that I was breathing turned into healing and I began to breathe in tangible healing And I didn't realize the significance that I first was breathing in this cloud of healing. And then this cloud of healing forms over the waters, and then it goes over the land of California, then goes over America and over the world. And I hear the Lord say, in the dream, audible voice of God says, Chad, it's time for you to come out of the closet and tell people you're an intercessor. And I'm like, okay. And it was this whole wooing that, connecting with God in nature. So I call the ministry, catch the wave, and the tagline be, discover God outside. You know, Romans 8, 29, all of creation is groaning in intercession for the revealing of the sons of God. That I love going to the send. I love going to the call. I mean, I remember going to the first call in 2000 on on the lawn in D.C., uh, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to watch 40,000 people. Well, that day, there was 400,000 people worshiping Jesus. It was amazing. And Benny Hinn saying, Holy Spirit, come! He, like, you know, came in in a helicopter and then, like, you know, had his suit and the whole deal. And then, and it was amazing. It was awesome. But I love going into the mountains. I love going out in the ocean and knowing that there's a worship song being sung by all of creation. To look out and see 30,000 trees and know that they're singing to Jesus. It gives me the same chills and carries the same weight as I do seeing 40,000 people worshiping Jesus. That creation is an intercession. Creation is in a worship service. So I was doing this ministry, Catch the Wave. And then in October, I was in a severe car accident where I flipped my forerunner five times. And when I was flipping, I had the thought of, no way this is happening. And I get knocked out. Right before I get knocked out, I feel fingers go across my legs, across my torso, across my chest, across my face. And then I felt the forming of a palm going around me, which could only, like, the way to articulate that felt like a cocoon. I was being wrapped in a cocoon. Like, I literally felt like the hand of God come over me. And then I get knocked out, and when I'm knocked out, I encounter one of these healing angels that I saw in the dream. And he comes walking to me, and he smiles. And the moment he smiles, I come back into consciousness. I'm faced against traffic in a ditch right by the 5 freeway. And I'm a little disoriented, concussed, trying to figure out what's going on, getting my bearings. I realize I'm missing my left shoe. Where's that? I can't find, you know, looking for my phone. The CHP officers are running towards me, and they say, hey, we watched the whole thing happen. 
you know, we saw you flipping around your forerunner and get ejected through the sunroof. And I went to go talk to him and I had a bunch of stuff in my mouth and I thought it was my teeth. And I pulled out four rocks. They were sizes of like quarters, half dollars. And, you know, it was, it totally saved my life that I was knocked out. You know, that somebody, if you research car accidents with drunk drivers and sober drivers, I think it's those with, uh, that are drunk intoxicated, where um, their 70% uh, have a greater chance of survival in a car accident compared to the person that's sober because they tense up. So I wasn't tense, I was knocked out. Like, so I just, my body was just, you know, and I had road rash on my back. I had a couple holes in my foot. I had a big con contusion on the side of my head where I hit my head really hard on the asphalt, on the five freeway, just skipping along. You know, and dealing with survivor's guilt, knowing all the people that died before me flipping a vehicle, the doctors began to tell me all the people that had died, there had already been five fatalities that week of people flipping their SUVs. So you kind of go down the road of like, wow, why them and not me? Um, I had a four month old at that time. My, my boy, David. And it's crazy because you're like, you know, you, you, you watch God show up and then you have moments that are really tough. Like you know, we had a miscarriage in 2017, June 1st. And then we find out we get pregnant with David and he's due on June 1st, 2018. And so we're celebrating restoration and we're celebrating, you know, like, like, this is amazing. Like, he's due on the one-year anniversary of our miscarriage. Like, talk about redemption. But then we kind of got hit, like, after David was born, and we didn't realize, like, man, what, why, why is Julie dealing with postpartum? Or why am I, you know, dealing with some stuff? And like, whether that be battling anxiety or depression or whatever. Because I was like, man, what if we lose this one? You know, there was a couple of those thoughts that came in that I had to fight. And I didn't realize till after we had David that, oh, you only grieved for three months? Because I went into like redemption, restoration, like, okay, we don't need to grieve anymore. We, you know, it's been redeemed, but I didn't go through the full process of grief. See, the deal is, is sometimes it's, it's always interesting pendulum swings, right? And to be in that radical middle where it is so important to be present in your pain, to not run from it, not shove it down deeper inside, or to cope, to have unhealthy coping habits that are getting rid of hiding that pain, you know, ignoring that pain. But then sometimes you get lost in your pain where you begin to isolate and you begin to, you know, build a case and you begin to build a victim mentality. And that's the crazy thing because a lot, there's some people in here, we've been victimized, but we cannot say yes to becoming the identity of a victim. So you need to be able to say, hey, yeah, it's legitimate. I've had, I've been victimized, but I will not let myself become a victim. That's why when I started building Catch the Wave of like, we need to go pick up trash. We need to go take out with people with anxiety disorders, with, we're dealing with mental illness stuff. We go pick up trash because we're doing something to contribute to society, to a community that's way bigger than us. So I'm coming out of this car accident. I have severe PTSD. I'm having night terrors. Um, you know, I'm having dreams about a car accident. I get into a car, I have a panic attack. I jumped on an airplane. I've almost flown over 2 million miles. I'm like almost the 2 million mile mark. And I, somebody gave me a car, a 300,000 mile car, because <laughs> I, I totaled my forerunner. So I jumped on a plane and I had a full on panic attack, got claustrophobic. And I was like, okay, I need to like, this is crazy. Like this is part of who I am. Like I travel all the time. And now I'm on a one hour plane ride and I'm having a claustrophobic attack. Like this is crazy because the enemy is, you know, trying to steal, kill and destroy the call that's on my life. And I'm like, this is what I do. I jump on planes. So I met with a, a psychologist. 
who, deal, who works with uh, Navy SEALs that come back uh, from tours of duty in Afghanistan, Iraq, to assess if they have PTSD. And she goes, yeah, you have severe PTSD, but we're going to work together. Do you know that those that have PTSD, 92% that have faith in a higher power overcome PTSD? And then you have to get creative, like to discover and cultivate peace in your life, to kill anxiety, to kill depression, to kill PTSD. You, there, there's many arrows that God will give you. One of them for me was a month after my car accident. I was spending time with the Lord. The Holy Spirit comes to me and says, Chad, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, sweet. That's why we're like hanging out. That's why I'm here at the prayer chapel at Bethel. Like, I'm here to hang out with you, for you to talk to me and for me to talk to you. And, and, and the Holy Spirit says, no, no, no. I don't want to encounter 37-year-old Chad. I want to encounter 7-year-old Chad. And the Holy Spirit takes me. I see myself as a 7-year-old boy. He takes me into this meadow that looks like Yosemite. And right there in the middle of the meadow is an art easel. And the Holy Spirit says, Chad, it's time to paint again. And suddenly I get triggered of, I went on a road trip with my grandma, who's a professional artist. She was a sculptor and a watercolor artist. And she was doing a gallery tour through Laguna Beach and, and Carmel and Monterey and Ashland. And so I went with her. And my mom, she's a creative art, she's the creative arts pastor at Bethel. She's amazing. And so I kind of had this generational inheritance and there was something that happened at seven where I began to go to art teachers and art classes and I began to get criticized and critiqued in my art and I began to shut down art. It was a place of pain. It was a place of I wasn't enough. I began to focus on other strengths and begin to excel in sports and different stuff. So I just began to focus and get maybe some of my self-esteem from those places and those places of success. And that, oh man, if I touch art, like, and then it was like this kind of learning curve began to happen. Like people were progressing in their creativity and I wasn't there yet. I'm still drawing stick figures. And it was just this place of like, bummer. When I was a freshman in high school, I took uh, ceramics and I flunked. I don't know how you flunk ceramics, but I did it. I would begin to self-sabotage yeah. yeah. the part of me that was an artist. And it took me almost dying to rediscover art. So I said, okay, then we're game on. And I would begin to go to my mom's art classes. She teaches art, you know, like I began to go to my mom's art classes. And I would go to like, I would go to some of like her crazy, like excelled, like everyone's like this amazing artist and they're doing like the faces of Reading and it was in response to the fire, like all their arts on like in the city hall and I'm in there like where they're, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God. And I was just breaking comparison. I don't need to compare. I'm going to just stay in my lane. But I would do art and it would be so therapeutic. I would be like, oh my gosh, I feel like I just got rid of something. You know, like just get lost in there. And then you're just like, wow, like something just was released. Begin to learn to play the guitar. Begin to learn about the power of my voice and begin to learn different languages. Not like logistic, the linguistics. Talking about the language of music, the language of fathering, the language of art, the language where there was, there was these things that were coming alive in me that I didn't know were dormant, that were actually causing neural pathways to reform and to begin to have healthy coping places where I could break off anxiety and step into peace. I'll land the plane here. It's so important to know what season you're in because there's times when you need to be aggressive. There's times when you need, you know, the violent take it by force, those that inherit the kingdom. But then there's times to know when to just rest by the river. You know, and if you get out of touch with your seasons, whether it's a time of war or it's a time of rest, when you get your seasons mixed up, you know, you can kind of mess things up like the way David did. 
It was a time of battle, and he stayed back. But sometimes we could go into a time of battle, and we are just getting all, it wasn't ever uh, our time to go. It's time to rest by the river. And I remember David and his mighty men going to Ziklag. I don't have time to read, you know, it's in 1 Samuel 30, and I'm just going to give you the chat synopsis. But David and his mighty men get rejected by the enemy. It's a bad day when you get rejected by the enemy. Because he would, you know, he would join forces with, with the, like the, the enemies of the Philistines. And he would kind of help Israel out by joining forces like kind of Israel's enemies, but also the enemies of the Philistines. And he goes over there with him and his mighty men. And they're like, yeah, we don't need you. That's a bummer day. They go back to Ziklag, this is 1 Samuel 30, and they find everything's burning. You know, their wives and children were kidnapped. All the oxen and cattle and resources were plundered and taken. And his mighty men go, David, we're going to kill you. They were grabbing rocks to stone him. And it says that David began to strengthen himself in the Lord. And see, when you go through battles, when you go through tests, it's a time to learn how to build a well inside where you begin to strengthen yourself in the Lord. Jesus, there's so many things that I want to hit, but strengthen yourself in the Lord. So they go... They're about right across the river, and one-third, 200 out of the 600 men say, we're too exhausted. And so David says, you know what? It's okay. I release you. Go lay by the river. We'll go back and get what the enemy has stolen. They come back with everything, and the 400 men are like, it's not okay that we give these 200. They didn't do anything. And David made a decree, and it was established from that point on as a law that everyone gets back what the enemy had stolen. And there's some of us here that, that you have been fighting. You have been in the wartime, and God's saying, hey, I need you to trust in me, and I need you to trust in your community where you can come from a place of strength that's not weakness and say, hey, I'm going to lay here by the river. Can I will trust that you go and get back what the enemy has stolen. Let other people fight for you. There's something about trust. I feel like the Lord just wants to establish and just impart that unlocks peace. It's so good to dream with God. God doesn't give you dreams to tease you. He doesn't give you dreams that are not attainable. You know that Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire realized is the tree of life. Like God's not up in heaven. Like, like I have a dream to see like missing parts, missing limbs come back. And, and, like, I have even had dreams at night that I'll, like, see someone with a missing arm or something like that. And, the, and he, God's not up in heaven, like, you know, grabbing Gabriel and saying, oh, I'm going to give Chad another missing limbs dream. Like, he'll never see it. It's not possible. Like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, my gosh, he's, he's at the grocery store, and he's praying for that guy who's missing a finger. He'll never see it. Like, he doesn't set us up for failure. He doesn't give us desires and like, something that's not, like, possible. Which is pretty awesome because I've seen a guy in India who had no eyeballs. He was born without eyeballs. And I watched God give him brand new eyeballs. I saw a guy in San Diego who uh, was in a landscaping accident. And he had his thumb chopped off. And me and my dad watched his thumb grow back. Pretty awesome. But there's something about trust and I love dreaming with God. And I used to go down with, when, in 2002, 2003, 2004, I traveled with Bill Johnson and Chris Valentin to Harvest Rock. 
Cheon's church. And I would always dream, like, God, one day I'm going to minister at Harvest Rock. Like, and I would just, like, dream, like, getting words of knowledge and, like, praying for people and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait. Like, one day, you know, and that, that's good. That's good to be dreaming with God. And, like, and so in 2005, we moved down to Laguna Niguel in Orange County. And my wife is going to Azusa Pacific to get her music degree. And Harvest Rock was doing this Revival Alliance conference. And so, you know, you had Randy Clark and John Arnott and all these different ones. And, and so I went to the conference and my wife says, hey, Chad, I have a music performance on Thursday night. Can you come to it? It's like 8, 8.30. And I'm like, yeah, I'll totally go. And then I go, I'm like, okay, I could probably go to worship. And then I'm going to go over to Azusa Pacific. And so right before worship starts, Cheon grabs me and says, hey, I've heard of some of your stories, some of your testimonies. Can you just share one testimony after worship? And Daniel just said, I'm a maximizer. And so I was like, you know what? I could share like a four minute testimony, then run to Azusa Pacific. And, and so I'm, you know, worship ends and Cheon has me come up. And Che uh, just, he's about ready to hand the microphone to me. And he goes, what is on you? And he goes flying back in the drum set with the microphone. And so I thought to myself, wait a second, what is on me? Like, let me just take a quick evaluation. And I've been praying since a boy, God, let me be the man of your right hand. David would pray this prayer. And I would pray the prayer with, with, with Gideon. God, put me on like a glove. And I would be like, oh, God, you're like, you're, you're all over me, you know? And, and I was like, I don't need a microphone. And I just say, just take it, more of God. And like people just started getting rocked by the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, you, you had uh, Heidi Baker and Ro Heidi and Roland, they were like, in the Korean pastor section with their legs up in the air shaking and Georgie and Banoff is running over, like jumping over people, like praying and, you know, and Bill Johnson just like, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Just really calm, cool and collected. And, uh, and I went to the, um, the handicap section. I say, get up in the name of Jesus. And probably, you know, 80% got up out of their wheelchair. I have no idea what their condition was, but some people began to run around, and it was just like this crazy, crazy time. And then I hand the microphone over to, you know, I mean, Che kind of army crawls, gives me the microphone. I like share a quick story and just release impartation. And then I hand the mic back, and he begins to, you know, go through the service, and I'm like running out of there. Like, I gotta get out of there. I gotta get to Julia's performance. John and Carol are not are preaching that night. They grab me and they say, Chad, the anointing of God is all over you. You need to speak. We, this is our night to preach, but you need to speak. And I'm like thinking in my head, like, wow, this is pretty amazing, you know? And then Cheon comes running over and goes, hey, I don't know what John and Carol are telling you, but I'm the father of this house. I think you need to speak tonight or maybe share with John and Carol. And, and I'm, I'm thinking in my head, like, I'm going to come home tonight with the DVD of me speaking and some chocolates and some flowers saying, sorry, I missed the performance, babe, but check out what happened. But thank God it's not out of your mind that your, that your mouth speaks, but it's out of your heart your mouth speaks. And I found myself saying the words to Che and John and Carol, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so honored, but I made a commitment to my wife. I think I broke some traffic laws to get there. And I get to this music performance and I'm like two minutes late and I'm walking in the back and somebody goes, shh. And there was something in me. I was like, do you know who I am? Like, <laughs> I'm the man of his right hand. Like he put me on like a glove. And, and I sat down like with that thought and I, I had this like revelation of like, this is, this is exactly where I need to be. Like, this is so refreshing that I'm in a room, like, like coming from the complete opposites of, you know, having 3,000 people going, wah, you know, and like, and you're on the stage, to now sitting in the back and people are shushing you. And I'm like, but this is the perfect place. Because it came from a place of trust. Like if God, God will give you opportunities that you have been dreaming about that are totally God ordained, but sometimes it could be a test that if it begins to blow up relationships around you, it was actually a test Will you trust him that he will bring you back to those places in the right timing when it's time. And it's a place of trust that it was years later that I spoke for the first time at Harvest Rock. But I trusted 
in the process. That I chose relationships. There's something that happens where you have a peace that God is with me. If God's with me, who can be against me? So, I'm sure we're all aware. I don't need to give any more statistics. But I'm sure we're pretty aware of just anxiety, depression that's going on in our country. Whether that's social media anxiety, whether that's, you know, whatever it may be. That, um, and I just want to pray for peace. I want to pray over every one of us that this would become the summer of peace. That we would encounter the Prince of Peace. But I, I would encourage you to begin to discover what are the creative ways to begin to manifest, cultivate peace in your life. So just put your hand on your heart. So, Lord, we just release the Prince of Peace. Holy Spirit, just come. That you would surround us with peace, that we would be covered in peace. That all anxiety, anyone that's dealing with, with sleeplessness, that's dealing with any kind of night terrors, we just release peace and rest. And Lord, that you would begin to give us creative ways to step into peace. And I pray, Lord, any of the chinks in our armor, any of the arrows that are coming at us to get us to question God's goodness. See, my car accident, one of the crazy things was, is it was such a grandiose moment of God's goodness that it began to heal all the places that had chinks in the armor. Of like, This was such a grandiose moment. So, Lord, that we would have it reinforced in our spirits, in our lives. That you're our strong tower. That you're our protector. Even in the midst of circumstances and waves crashing in, screaming the opposite, we just release the Prince of Peace. Peace.